Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. Welcome to the Masters of Business. My name is Morris Mizalowski. I'm the business futurist. And together we're going to explore the year of 2025. We're going to look at the way that business might be, the things that you and I are likely to see, want and do, the way culture is going to change, the way technology will change, and importantly, we're going to figure out what you and I need to do right now to begin to make sense and profit out of it. The first thing we need to do is understand that the future doesn't really exist. It's one of these ephemeral things that we talk about. It's a romantic Disney notion that we have, that tomorrow is a space that will arrive by itself, that on some mythical date in the calendar, all of a sudden this thing will pop out and the new world will evolve. The reality is that the future takes a lot of hard work. It starts right here, right now. Our conversation is the beginning of your future. What you and I need to do is to figure out what's important ahead. The role, honestly, is that there is no magic here. There's nothing untoward. There are things that you and I know that are more likely to occur. And what you and I need to do is to figure out what those things are for your business and for your business alone. So the future starts right here, right now, with this conversation. You know, there are some strange things happening. For 34 years, I've done this looking forward stuff. The reality is that when I started my practice, five years was about the horizon sign. And when we talked about a cultural change, we talked about a 25-year change. You and I are now seeing dramatic changes day in, day out. There are businesses that we take for granted, like Facebook, like Uber, like Alibaba, like Airbnb. We talk about them as if they're all natural beings. All of them are under 10 years old. And what's even more extraordinary about each and every one of them, the multi-billion dollar corporations that you and I now use as ordinary case studies in conversation, is that none of them own a physical asset. Facebook owns absolutely no content whatsoever. They rely on you and I to put it up. Airbnb does not own a hotel, but in seven years has become the largest, the fourth largest hospitality provider on the planet. Uber, similarly, does not own a car, does not train anybody in how to drive, but they are now the default in this technology space. And that's really the journey of tomorrow, that the marketplace is just so different the things that you and I need to be aware of are so markedly different from the things of yesterday. Not better, not worse, just extremely different. So some of the changes that we're seeing ahead, one of the most fundamental shifts that I've noticed over the last 10 years or so is this shift to me, that the world now revolves around me. It revolves around my thinking. It revolves around what I want. Prior to that, it really was a matter of the world was something that we had to go to. The world was something I had to discover. I had to go to a library. I had to go to a client. I had to go to a retail outlet. All of these things were things. And what I took was a generic product. It was something that they offered me and that I accepted without much change to it. I now pull out a mobile phone, a smartphone, and I expect the world to come to me. I expect the world to give me a specialist answer. I can now find the answers to the most inane things I never thought to ask about 10 years ago. The world of me is really the beginning of our journey into tomorrow. It's one of the fundamental things that we need to understand. And we'll explore that notion as we work our way through. There are some other fundamental issues on the planet. The first of them is a huge change in demographics. The reality is that for the first time ever in our human existence, we have six generations alive and living. We have everybody from our builder generation, which are our 80 years plus, right through to Gen A, which are those that were born from 2010 onwards. Each of those is a new demographic. Each of those sees the world in a peculiar and particular way. For some industries, like pharmacy, it's an incredible new space. For others, they have yet to see where this space might evolve. When I talk to my builder clients, for instance, we're talking about building residential property now that are multi-generational, where two or three generations might live together. So lots of things to be taken out of this six generations. The question for you at the moment is, are you attracting all of these generations? Which ones of them are relevant to you? How, if they're relevant to you, what do they buy? What do they want? Importantly, how do they want to be communicated to? 
We're going back to this question of me. And each of them requires you to do something slightly or grossly different. What is it that you need to do to get in contact with each of these generations? We also are moving to a space that I refer to as an ambient world. We've been kids in a lolly shop for a long time. We've been excited by the box, excited by the screen, really excited to show off our new toys and our new apps. It was the technology itself that got lots of people excited. We're kind of over it now. We're into a space where it's really the end result that's important. It's like electricity and gas. We feel as if it's always been there. We're taking it for granted. And increasingly, it's not going to be the iPhone, the Samsung, or the IBM that's important. It really is what those things give me. It's how the world changes because I'm using it. And this ambient world we're moving into is not hung up on what the technology you're using. They're hung up on the end result. The fact that you have an app, the fact that you have a website, the fact that any of these exist really aren't all that important to them because it's taken for granted. Of course they exist. But how am I going to interact with it? How is it important to me? That's really the question we need to move forward on. So forget getting hung up on the iPads or whatever else it is. It really is about the end result that you and I need to talk us to. We also have this notion, for me, that we're moving into a dynamic life. Work-life balance never really made sense. I rallied against it for 20 years or more. Work-life balance assumed we weren't human. It assumed we could put part of ourselves up on a shelf while we did something else. And that might have been OK before we had technology, because when we were at work in the old days, without the internet, without all of these things, we could kind of park our lives outside because we didn't really get many people coming in. There wasn't much encroachment in our day-to-day -day work. With new technology, with Facebook, with Twitter, and all the other things that you and I are so engrossed in, with the fact that we carry around with us this 24-7 ambient piece of technology, all sorts of things happen at any particular time in our lives. And what you and I have done over the last eight years or so is to understand that we want to take care of whatever that thing is right here, right now. It's important to me at this second. I don't really want to wait till five o'clock. That doesn't make any sense. I've seen it now, I want to action it. And a lot of the world of work moving forward is tied up in this. I don't believe that we'll have a nine to five workspace anymore. Again, that's an industrial revolution model. In the industrial revolution, many hands made light work. Turn up at nine o'clock, work through to five o'clock, come back the next day, let's do it for five days, take two days off for the weekend, let's do it by 48 weeks, take four weeks off, but you better be back at the end of the holidays to do it all again. Do it for 40 years, retire, get a cake, get a watch, get a pension, and then die after seven years. And that was pretty much the way that the world of a baby boomer was. Today's life is so different. We have this ambient technology. We're always on. We're always thinking about a whole lot of things. In the nine to five space, which is gone, is going to be replaced by project and task. Increasingly, you and I are going to be doing work where and when it's appropriate, rather than going to a fixed space, rather than doing it at a fixed time. The reality is that whatever we do, whether it's work, whether it's charity, whether it's sport, it's all going to be dictated by where and when and how and why it's best to do it. That's tomorrow's trigger. I just finished a large project with one of our top four banks looking at their workforce through to 2025. And we found, much to our surprise, that 60% of their workforce, again, this is of a large bank, already works project and task driven. Because today's banking world doesn't require tellers in branches the way they did before. It requires people to answer your phone at two o'clock in the morning when you want it. It requires a bank lender that can come to you at the time that's appropriate for you. So they've changed their workforce. They've changed their hours. They've changed their people so that they can suit the end customer. Again, coming back to that notion of hyper-personalized me. We also have this growing belief that we will live to 140 plus. A baby boomer will definitely live to 100. A Gen X, a Gen Y, a Gen Z, most probably to 120. And kids that are born today will live to 150. That's given the advances we have in technology. It's given the way that culture's changed. It's given that the way that we look after ourselves. This longevity means that our life as we know it will change forever. It means that we'll be working into 80 and 90 years of age. Now again, I don't think this is going to be a nine to five. I think this is going to be project and task driven. We'll come in and out of things as we need to do them. We most probably will have one central form of income, 
but I think we'll supplement that with a whole lot of other incomes. So we might be an accountant or a landscaper, but then again, we might jump into an Uber or perhaps rent out our property Airbnb or do something else to bring an income as we need it, where and when. We will start to do all kinds of things that make this long life purposeful and very different from the one today. Because 140 or 120 or 100 years is going to be lived in relatively good health. We are going to be able to sustain ourselves and it's going to mean a huge shift in who we are, what we are, the sorts of products, the sorts of services and what's important to us. And there are a whole lots of new industries that will come out of that as well. Whole lots of new services that people will need. Think ageing. I think the service industry itself will be more prepared and have more income. So we will be able to get people to mow our grass, walk our dogs and do all kinds of things. Lots of thoughts in there as well. So think about if we do have this ageing population, this population that's growing, but increasingly living to a longer age, what products, what services are you To continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.